Michael Umbrick is the curator of the Historic Lad Observatory at Brown University Physics. Prior to this, he was the coordinator of the Cormac Planetarium at the Museum of Natural History in Roger Williams Park. He is an astronomer, physicist, chemist. He has over 30 years of experience in science communication, public outreach, and museum practices. His research is focused on the history of science and technology. He has also been involved in satellite communications and analyzing the orbital dynamics of CubeSats operating in low Earth orbit. He is an amateur radio operator licensed as W9GYR. He will tell us about timekeeping at Lab Observatory. Welcome, Michael. And I will stop my share and let you share your screen. Okay, great. Uh, before I start, uh, right now I'm at home, well, in my workshop, and I want to draw your attention, if you can see it, to this clock up here. I'll, I'll be mentioning that clock. This is an antique from the 1890s, which I've wired up to a uh, modern timekeeping uh, signal generating system. But let's get started. Uh, let me just get my PowerPoint up and ready. Okay. Um, can you see the slides now? I can. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. So one of the things that observatories have traditionally done is measure the correct time by observing stars. And there's a variety of ways that they do it. Um, this image that I found in a book from 1889 is amazing. We have these precision pendulum clocks. And each time it ticks, is that okay? the dial of the Good. clock is a resonator. It, it's designed to amplify the sound of the clock ticking. This astronomer is sitting in front of the transit telescope. He has a hat with a tube connected to the side of the clock. This tube is an acoustic transfer tube. He's using it to listen to the ticking of the clock. So you would glance at the dial. Okay, right now it is one hour, two minutes, and three seconds. And each time you hear that click, you would be four seconds, five seconds, six seconds. And then you would sit in the dark, observe your stars. And when you saw something interesting, you would know exactly what time it is and write it down. So there's a variety of reasons why timekeeping is important. Uh, one of them, scientific. During the mid-1800s, the railroads were growing so fast, they couldn't keep up with the demand. Between Providence and Worcester, there was a single train track. A train heading northbound from Providence would pull over on a side spur and wait and look at their watch. They would wait for the southbound train to pass them, and then they would move on to the main track and continue. If you didn't have the correct time, head-on collision. Uh, this is one of the first photographs, the daguerreotype, that was taken of a train wreck. Valley Falls, Rhode Island. The Providence and Worcester line, these two cranes collided because there was a bend in the road. They didn't know what time it was. They continued on even though they shouldn't have. 
New York Times, 1853. The tone of the articles is a little bit shocking. I mean, today they're pretty staid and Okay. Um, these train wrecks were so horrific. Michael, we just we just lost your screen. You see it now? Oh, no, wait. I just see. Hold on a second. I bumped the cable. Do you have it now? Yes, we are back. Okay, great. Um, so this is a clipping from the New York Times. These train crashes that were caused by the incorrect time horrified the public. There were congressional inquiries. Um, the companies that operated the trains were blamed for it. They denied that they were responsible. It was just an accident. Slaughter by railroad. I mean, the tone of these newspaper articles is like nothing that you would see today um, from a publication like the New York Times. You'll notice that the word timepiece is in italics. That's because they blame the conductor for not knowing what the correct time was. If you've ever seen an old movie, you'll notice that a conductor will reach into his pocket, pull out a pocket watch, and look at it. Just about every movie that has a train has a scene like that. This was not a casual thing. Uh, this was a safety measure where they would check the time to make sure that the exact moment that they left the station was the correct time. So where did this time come from? Uh, observatory. This is Winslow Upton at the Lad Observatory. We have a 12-inch refractor. Uh, the mount is made by George Sade Mueller. The optics by John Bushier. And here's a view of the exterior. On the left-hand side, you see the first floor with the dome above it. On the right-hand side, you see the part of the building that we call the transit room. That's the part that I'll be concentrating on today. Uh, this is a blueprint. At the left, which is east, you can see room 105 is a transit room. On the right, 101, uh, that U-shaped structure that is sideways is the pier that the equatorial telescope sits on top of. And traveling down the corridor from east to west is where the timekeeping system is within the building. Here's a view looking towards the east. So we see a hallway. Uh, on the right, there's a barometer that is part of the early weather station, and you can see a transit telescope down at the end of the hallway. If we look in the opposite direction towards the west, uh, we see a door that is open that has a clock inside of it and more weather instruments. A transit telescope can only point at the meridian. You can't turn it east or west. It can only move from south to the zenith, to the north. This is used to look at the exact time at which a star transits the meridian. So the Earth's rotation is turning the view that we see of the stars so that a star appears to move in front of the eyepiece of the telescope. Uh, another view, there's a second transit shed, which is just a little bit of a distance away from the observatory. Uh, this one has a roll off roof. Just beneath the dome, you'll see a white structure. Uh, that's our weather station uh, that we used to have 100 years ago, before the National Weather Service was created. And here's a view of the interior. 
with the roof rolled off. The first transit telescope uh, that was delivered to LAD when it opened in 1891 did not work very well. And so the manufacturer, Sig Mueller, uh, constructed a second one. And this is the one that we have today. In addition to teaching astronomy, Brown University also taught uh, engineering and surveying. And we taught classes that used transit instruments to determine latitude and longitude on the surface of the Earth. Uh, this was critically important during both World War I and World War II. Um, very large numbers of students were being drafted into the military, and they would learn how to navigate via the stars and determine their location on the surface. In order to accommodate these students, we built another transit shed, which had five telescopes in. And this is just a little bit to the east of uh, the observatory. Another view of it uh, from the other direction. So if you look at a star map, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. On the left-hand side of it, it has zero to 60 degrees from the equator to north. And then at the top, we see the hours of right ascension 14 through 24. And so if I see the star at the center, uh, Deneb, I can tell exactly what time it is when I see it through the transit telescope by reading the numbers off of the star map. The time that you read is sidereal, not solar time. Uh, a solar day is 24 hours exactly. A sidereal day is four minutes short, 23 hours, 56 minutes. The difference is due to the Earth rotating as it is simultaneously moving around the sun. So the sun returns to the same position, but you have to wait a little extra for the Earth to rotate uh, for a star to be in the same position that it was the previous night. This is the view through a transit telescope. Uh, the reticle has a single horizontal line and five vertical lines. At the left, we see a star. At the right, Crescent Venus. As the Earth is rotating, the star will appear to move from left to right. And as it does, it will move behind each one of these threads. And it will wink out for a very brief amount of time. The astronomer would be sitting at the eyepiece and tap the telegraph key. This would send a signal through a wire to a chart recorder that would record the exact time that the star blinked out. These threads have to be incredibly thin. Even a human hair is too thick. The only material that it could use in that era was spiderweb threads. And so what you would do is have a spider in a jar. You would take a pencil, dip it into the jar, pick up the spider, bump it off, and it would drop down on a web. The circular web threads are sticky, but not strong. The radial ones that are like bicycle spokes are strong, but not sticky. When the spider falls off the pencil, it will create the strong, but not sticky thread. And as you turn the pencil, you can harvest the spider web threads. Um, I've done this a few times. It, it's a little tricky. Um, you have to use binocular microscope and it, it's really hard to work with something that is a tenth of the thickness of a human hair. Then there are very tiny uh, grooves in the metal around the back of the eyepiece. And you place the spider web thread into the grooves and then glue it in place. 
afterwards. Um, it's at the focal plane of the eyepiece, so that both the object that you're looking at through the objective and the spider web threads are both in focus. So now we have taken a measurement of the exact moment when a star passed behind the threads. There are five measurements because of the five vertical threads. You take the average of all five to get the exact moment of the center. This is the telegraph control system. You'll see a panel in the back, which is used to control the current and voltage uh, of the signals that you're sending. That observatory opened about a decade before there was electricity in the neighborhood. And so we would uh, make our own batteries to provide the electricity to power the system. In the front, you'll see boxes that have lids open. Inside of them are marine chronometers. When you're at sea, you have the opposite problem at lab. At an observatory, we know our exact latitude and longitude, and then we solve the problem of what is the exact time. If you're at sea, you calibrate your precision chronometer clock against an observatory. You take it to sea. You know the exact time, but you don't know where you are. And so observing the stars, you solve the inverse problem. I know the time. I know the angle of the star. Calculate where you are. So these are the batteries. Uh, that power the telegraph system. This is in the basement of the observatory. Uh, those are about two liters each. They contain a chemical called blue vitriol or copper sulfate. When you first mix up the, the chemicals for the battery, and yes, we didn't just go to buy, buy batteries at the store. We had to buy the chemicals and make the batteries ourselves. When you first mix it up, it has a intensely blue color. But as the battery starts to die, the color of the liquid gets fainter and fainter. I can tell that those batteries are in need of refreshing because the blue color is not very really intense. So the signals from the astronomer tapping the telegraph key are sent to a machine called a chronograph. You'll notice that there are weights underneath it. You wind it up like a clock. As the weights very slowly drop, there's a governor in the middle that regulates the speed. The drum turns once a minute. And as it does, that little carriage that has a pen will move from left to right. And so when you look at a close-up of the uh, paper record that the pen has left, you'll see that there are lines that are vertical, one minute apart. It's also connected to a clock. And so the clock will send a pulse every second that will make the pen move from left to right and back. And so you can count the number of seconds from the clock and the time that the astronomer observed the star and measure the offset. This can be done to one one hundredth of a second. That's considerably more accurate than your cell phone today. This system, a typical cell phone might have an error of 100 to maybe even 500 milliseconds. This system, that we operated a century ago was accurate to about 10 milliseconds, which is about as good as the time on your computer, maybe even a little better. In order for these precision pendulum clocks to be accurate, you have to very carefully control the environment. If you have a metal pendulum rod that's swinging back and forth, the temperature changes. If it goes up, the metal expands, maybe by the thickness of a human hair. 
if the temperature goes down, it contracts and gets a tiny bit shorter. Again, thickness of the human hair. The pendulum is swinging 86,400 times every single day. Even though those subtle changes only make a difference of milliseconds, microseconds, it's cumulative. It adds up. If the pendulum changes length by one human hair, you might gain 30 seconds per week. We keep our pendulum clocks inside of a vault, which is thermally insulated, isolates the clocks from variations in um, vibrations. And then inside there, we have this clock, the reflex. You'll notice that there is a glass bell jar uh, at the top above the dial, and then a tank underneath. Uh, what you see to the right is a bicycle pump. You evacuate some of the air from inside this tank to keep it at a constant temperature and pressure. Um, not quite a vacuum. During the early times when this clock was built, they didn't have oil that could withstand a vacuum. It would evaporate. So it was operated at about 80% of an atmosphere. So the, the goal here was not to have the least amount of air. It was to have a constant amount of air, temperature, pressure, and humidity. And once you seal this clock, you can't adjust the pendulum to make corrections to calibrate it. So what you do is you let a little bit of air in, pump a little bit of air out, as you change the air resistance inside the tank, you can speed up or slow down the clock until it gets to the correct rate. That clock is set to sidereal time. This one is set to soul. Inside, there is a brake circuit mechanism. Each time the pendulum swings back and forth, it bumps into a tiny little lever and closes a switch, and that sends a pulse of electricity through the wires. The observatory in Providence was wired up to many different clocks. Uh, you can see here that there were literally hundreds. Every day at noon and 8.30, we would send a pulse to all of these clocks throughout the city. Um, especially the fire stations. They had bells, whistles, some sort of an audible signal. And when the people in the neighborhood heard that, they knew that they could adjust their clocks to our precise time. The temperature variations in an observatory also happen inside somebody's home. And so if you have a pencil grandfather clock, it's going to run at a different rate in the summer versus the winter. And you would very often have to make adjustments to it. And those adjustments were done this way. In later years, they had radio signals, telephone, um, but before that, you would literally listen for the, the correct time. Uh, some observatories and port cities, they would connect their clock to a cannon. Each time at one o'clock, 8.30 p.m., the clock ticked. It would send a pulse of wire that would ignite the gunpowder gun power, and fire a cannonball. And the ships in the harbor would hear that and adjust their clocks, knowing that it was the correct time. I really want a time cannon. In the 1890s, uh, just before LAD opened, we used to get time signals from other observatories. But the problem with sending a time signal via telegraph is that a hurricane, a blizzard, knocks your telephone, pulls over, cuts the wires, you lose the correct time. So having it local 
shorter wire lengths um, is a, an advantage in terms of reliability. Uh, this article from the Providence Journal is interesting. They actually talk about the electrical resistance of the wire from Latin Observatory on, over to City Hall and how many ohms it was. Technical details about the electrical properties of a wire are not something that you would typically see uh, in the modern era. So we hire astronomers 100 years ago to do all this work to provide the correct time. We're going to charge you for it. We're going to sell you the time. $100, $200 per year. Um, that's about, I don't know, $5,000 taking into account inflation. We literally sold time to the public. And this time was used by courthouses, factories, at a factory, you have a time clock. That time has to be strictly regulated. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to get your fair pay. And so when you place your card into the time clock, you would know that Lad Observatory, you're getting paid for every second you work. We also did experiments. This is a clock made by Hezekiah Conan. You'll notice that there's one large dial at the top, four small dials below that. And underneath that, there are four pendulums. The pendulums swing independently. And the idea here was that you had one pair on the right, another pair on the left. You take the average. Then you take the average of the two pairs to get the most accurate time. The four dials show the rate of each one of the four pendulums. The top dial uses mechanical gears to average the time from the four. Uh, it didn't work very well. There were vibrations from the pendulums that interfered with one another. It wasn't a very accurate clock. But it was an experiment that we tried. If you measure the exact time and can instantaneously compare it to someone else, you can tell the difference in longitude. So imagine that the sun is rising and in Boston, you see it trans the meridian. Short while later, you see a transit in Providence, and then New Haven, and then New York, and so on. By measuring the exact time between those meridian transits, you can calculate the exact longitude difference between the locations. At one point, the astronomers at LAD wanted to compare LAD observatory's position to Washington, D.C. The American Telephone and Telegraph Company, now known as AT&T, had telegraph wires running from Providence to, Boston, uh, to Washington. During the daytime, these were used for stock prices, commercial traffic, but at night, businesses closed, and they let us use their one and only wires that ran between the two cities to do a scientific experiment. This was kind of a big deal. I mean, can you imagine if I wanted to shut the internet down to use it for my exclusive use for just an hour? Um, we totally shut down the entire telegraph communication system just to do this one experiment. So here we see a chart recording of that experiment. The Riefler is the lab observatory clock, and then we have Washington. 
And you'll notice that uh, this is the chronograph recording where the horizontal lines are the minutes. And then those tick marks that you see going from left to right are the seconds. And you'll notice that one of the clocks is running at a different rate than the other. And that's because one is solar time, the other sidereal. And so they kind of go in and out of sync. This is sort of like tuning your guitar by listening to the beats. By having two clocks that are not running at the same rate, you can measure the exact offset by looking at the subtle differences between how they drift in and out of phase from one another. A little bit later, radio is invented and that observatory is on the forefront of using wireless signals to transmit time. You'll notice that it says uh, time signals from the Naval Observatory in Washington received at Mr. Donnelly's house. Mr. Donnelly lived across the street. He was actually a 20 year old that was a radio amateur. Uh, he built radios in his garage and sold them for magazines. And he collaborated with the astronomers at LAD to receive these time signals and compare them to our time. This experiment was quite extensive. The Naval Observatory had an enormous transmitter and a very sensitive receiver in Arlington, Virginia. And they were exchanging time signals with the Paris Observatory. So here we see a circuit diagram of the transmitter in Paris. And you'll notice that at the top right, they're using the Eiffel Tower as an antenna. Not the tower itself. The tower is just a support structure. There are wires that stretch from the tower down to the ground that radiate the radio signal that the Washington Naval Observatory received. The Naval Observatory then retransmitted those time signals, and that's what we heard at that observatory. If you look very closely, um, that little shed at the right that has the five transit telescopes in it, just above it, there's a vertical line. This is a uh, glass plate that was taken around 1905 or so. Um, we scanned them at ridiculously high resolution, kind of like one of those crime scene uh, television shows where we can zoom in and look at it in detail. That line is an antenna on the roof of Mr. Donnelly's house. And that's where they made the observations. You'll notice that uh, Harold Donnelly lived on Observatory Ave. That's our, our mailing address. <laughs> And this is the uh, transmitter uh, that the U.S. Naval Observatory used for sending the time signals that we received. Unfortunately, um, Winslow Upton, the director, passed away before he could analyze the data. Um, but other astronomers then did a follow-up. If you're ever in Providence, we're open on Tuesday evenings to the public. I can give you a tour and show you the timekeeping system, our equatorial, and uh, a lot of other things. So with that, I'll take some questions if anyone would like. So, so Mike, uh, I, I enjoyed that very much. And um, I guess I guess I'll... Um, uh, uh, I did have a question. I'll have to remember it again. Any any questions from the room or from the Zoom? Dr. Right. Yeah. Right. I have a question. All right. 
I heard a question. Yeah. So like <clears throat> take the star Deneb for example. And so how do I know what time it is using a transit telescope and Deneb? So Deneb crosses, you know, the middle of my transit telescope. How do I translate in that into what time it is? So first of all, you would have a star map and a catalog. The catalog would list the right ascension of the star as, for example, one hour, two minutes, three seconds, 40, 456 milliseconds. If my telescope is precisely pointed south, that is the exact sidereal time when I will see the star move through the center of my eyepiece and cross beneath the, the spider web threads. From there, I have to use a mathematical formula to calculate what the correct solar time is. So we work in sidereal time to make the observations. Think of it this way. You have 24 stars arranged above the Earth's equator. There's a one-hour star, a two-hour, a three-hour. Mm -hmm. As the Earth rotates, each one of these stars will cross through my spider web threads. And I know that that is the correct hour. So is it the same formula that's used for all these observations? Yes, because it's all dependent on the rotation of the Earth. And so it doesn't matter which of the 24 or 500 stars that I choose. Um, once I measure the exact sidereal time with an observation, I can then get the solar time by using that same formula. Does that formula change based on my latitude? Um, no, because at every latitude, the star is going to cross the meridian at the same time. Okay. And can you share, not necessarily now, but I would be interested. I'm a math teacher. Oh, I'd be okay. Interested in that formula. I, I'll send it to um, the club. Yeah. Okay. I'll forward it. Thank you. Okay. Here we go. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one is related to sidereal time. Uh, the earth, the uh, speed at which the Earth moves in its orbit changes because it's an ellipse, not a circle. And uh, does that have to be taken into account to get an accurate reading of sidereal time? So there's a couple of ways to approach that answer. Um, at the time that that observatory was doing these time signals, we assumed that the Earth's rotation was constant, didn't change. I'm talking about the revolution. <laughs> oh, well, uh, the revolution. Hold on a second. Um, we assumed that the Earth's rotation was constant. And then three decades later, it was discovered that Yesterday is a millisecond different than today. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow is a millisecond different from today. Um, the kinds of errors that you're talking about were much smaller than anything that they could have dealt with during that era. Your question becomes important when you start to get clocks that are more accurate than the ones that we have. I see. The, uh, the second question I had was, uh, did uh, over the over the time span when when these uh, time observations were active, uh, did precession of the equinoxes enter into it? Oh, that that's even smaller than the milliseconds of ah, okay. your theory. No, that's not. Well, it, that it is significant for star maps. Uh, you know, over well, fifty years. This gets back to the, the previous question, too. Uh, when I write a computer program to <clears throat> calculate a pendulum or timekeeping, I'll use a value for gravity that is six significant digits. Uh, my measurements are six significant digits. 
But at the end of the day, it all gets rounded off. Thank you. All right, Steve, you had a question? Yeah, I was just curious. You're dealing with spider webs here. And how often did they have to like replace those spider webs? That's just fascinating to me. Uh, we have a telescope, and I don't know exactly when the spider web threads were installed, but I assume it was around 1860. One of the six is broken. <laughs> we have a spectroscope that um, has a tiny bit of a single piece and is supposed to have several. Uh, I'm going to get a spider and <laughs> replace it. That is, yeah, that's what you got to do. <laughs> that's amazing. So, so Mike, a question about the uh, the ship's chronom chronometers you two had um, on the table. Were they ones that that uh, you know ships bring in to have them calibrated, or were they part of the observatory? No, uh, we would purchase ships chronometers to use as stopwatches, portable, accurate timepieces. So they were designed and sold to ships, except that one percent of the sales would go to observatories, and we would use them if we went to <clears throat> Virginia to watch an eclipse or a transit of Venus and use them for precision timekeeping. So they're intended for ship's use, but those were not um, ever on a ship. Okay. You can't run a pendulum on a, on a ship because of, of the uh, rocking of the, of the boat. So Actually, in a marine chronometer, uh, you have what's called a balance wheel. There are okay. two pieces of spiral metal that come out from a central source, and they have a, a small mass on them. The spiral is a bimetallic strip. Two metals that expand or contract with temperature at different rates. And so as the temperature changes, the two pieces of metal will get further or closer to the center, and that will change the rate to automatically compensate for the temperature changes. The box is gimbaled. You have a ring which can rotate and say forward, backwards, and that is on another gimbal that can rotate left and right. So as the ship is tossing and turning on the rough seas, the surface of the clock and more importantly, the balance wheel underneath the, the, the dial is perfectly level with the center of the earth. And so that's how you get around the whole problem of can't use a pencil in that seat. Cool. <laughs> question from, from the room? Uh, not a question, but just an observation. I remember reading that uh, during World War II, when they were using spider webs to make bomb sites, uh, that they used Black Widow spiders. That they used, oh, um, the story that I heard was that it was actually an astronomer uh, who kept the Black Widow in his office and kind of freaked out the other astronomers. He swore that Black Widow spider threads were better. Um, I, I don't believe that the military ever did that. They did, however, have these uh, rectangular frames with... Uh, an axle and a little crank. They had factories where people would harvest enormous amounts of, of spiderweb threads to use in military gun sites and so forth. Um, I doubt that those were Black Widow. At Brown, we have uh, in, environmental health and safety, you know, chemical, radioactive, biological hazards. Um, I actually got permission to get a Black Widow because I want to test the theory about whether or not they were better spider web threads. Um, but I was really worried that the custodian would clean my office and bump into it. And you don't want that happening. <laughs> Very good. Any any other questions or thoughts? That's not a good relationship with that. Come on, just back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> 
this this is fascinating. I'm always impressed by uh, some of the practical aspects that the people use their telescopes and clocks and, and the things they had to do back back then. And I'm sure it's done now. Like there's there's transit telescopes now. There's this is, stuff is still being done in some way, right? Um. Well, you use a radio telescope and you aim it at a pulsar. And it's the same basic principle. You wait for the signal to reach a maximum as the Earth's rotation moves your telescope across the pulsar. Um, but it's not so much phenoptically anymore. Um, another way that you can do it is a zenith telescope. So you have a, a pool, a large aperture, not very deep. You fill it with mercury. You start to slowly spin it, and it forms a parabola. Perfect optical surface, reflected. And it's looking straight up. So you know that the center of your view is directly above the center of the Earth. That's one way, another way that you could get the exact time. Um, but pulsars are pretty much the standard these days. Cool. Okay, Steve? Steve, you're muted. Steve, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so um, you mentioned that there were transatlantic um, communications um, by wireless um, where they they rebroadcast the um, the time signal. Is that did I understand that correctly? And yes. So. Okay, so let's say I want to send a time signal from Providence to, uh, from Lab to Providence City Hall. That's only a couple of miles. All I have to do is hire someone to climb up on a telephone pole, run away. But let's say I want to send it to New Haven, Connecticut. Okay, so the signal is going to get weak halfway across Connecticut. Yeah. You have to have a repeater where there's a battery connected to a relay and it retimes the signal. A mechanical relay is going to open and close on a time scale that is way less precise than having a single wire. Uh, so that introduces a lot of error. With the early time signals, um, repeating it was a significant problem. You could introduce a tenth of a second that totally obliterates your hundredth of a second precision. Once you start to get into the area era of vacuum tubes after World War One, uh, now you can have an instantaneous switch where you get the signal from Paris, you send it back out through the antenna in Virginia, and there's very little delay involved. It's early WWV, but but still, when you're doing transatlantic, um, how how much of a delay are you getting? Well, it's speed of light. So I mean, you you do have to calculate what the speed of light is between Paris and Washington. Sure, but but you but you still have mechanical. Um, um, oh oh no. By this era, they have vacuum tubes. Okay. And right. so there's no mechanical relays involved. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here's so it's 100 idea. times more accurate. Sure. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts for, for Mike? Yes. Yeah, we have one here. Um, I just wanted a correction in that they did use black widows because they were slower than the garden variety of spiders. And they did over a hundred feet of webs a week. So they produced more, they were more accurate, they were just more reliable than your regular garden variety spider. Very good. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. And and that's in um military factories. Yeah, they used it in World War II for their guns and ammo hmm. and everything else. So it is true. Hmm. Mike is taking notes. Very good. All right. Any? All right, Dave. Yeah. Uh, 
what happens or what takes place in any meaningful way at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich? Like Lab Observatory, my understanding is that it is primarily a museum and educational institution. What what did they do to establish the Prime Meridian? Oh, oh, uh, I, 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 I thought you were asking about how it's used today. I, I did, but now I've changed it. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so you can pretty much pick any place in the world to define zero degrees longitude. You can pick the, the pyramids in Egypt. Yep. Not a good choice because there's no observatory that has been making measurements for decades, centuries. Um, basically, Greenwich had a long history of continuously observing, which meant that their knowledge of where they were in the world was better than most observatories. So that was kind of the, the reasoning behind the selection of that site. Does that answer your question? Sure, thank you. Very good. Any other questions or, or thoughts for, for Mike? Mike, I, I enjoyed this very much and I wanted to thank you very much for your presentation. I think a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, at the beginning, someone asked me a question. And, oh, um, the sidereal solar time. Was that the question that? There was a asked? question about that, yes. Okay, they wanted to know the formula for it, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay, I'll, I'll look into that. Yep, yeah. send it to me and I will forward it on to Dave. And I also sent you a copy of my uh, slides and uh, if you want to share that with the group also. They're, they're awesome. on the they're on the, the drive already. Awesome, awesome. Right. Well, great meeting you all and hopefully um I'll probably be up in your area uh for the eclipse. I'm gonna be in southern New Hampshire a few days before the eclipse and then heading up to the uh Canadian border uh in April. You might see some of us there. Yeah. Be sure you get out there no. some days ahead of time or you're not going to make it. So I was planning on just picking a public park or something to set up a small telescope. Uh, but if you're planning a, a specific place where you think might be good, let me know. What I was saying is you, you can't wait until Monday to go up. You need to go up like You're gonna go up Saturday, Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. at least Saturday. Well, oh, I'm not going to stay in the... I'm going to be sleeping in southern New Hampshire, drive up, come back. I'm not going to... You're, you're not going to be able to. Yeah, My point is you cannot do that. Monday. The traffic is not going to allow that. Oh. There are only two roads around the White Mountains that, that head up into that part of New Hampshire. I know that. And they're both well, on the jam. I know. Yeah, expect, yeah, expect hours, eight hours or more of traffic. Yeah. Really? I, know, I, I went down to Columbia, South head. Carolina uh, for the the um, for the eclipse. And my, my oldest daughter was right in the center of it uh, where she lives. And, and there's like interstate highways everywhere. And they were jammed. Hmm. So, uh, I yeah. experienced the same. Yeah. I had four, two different interstate highways going north, each with four lanes going north. Nobody is moving. It yeah. was amazing. Wow. Yeah. A little bit of a and, reality. Well, we have room three, so no worries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Pretty much. We yeah. Across 16, maybe. Plan for a week. All right. Yeah. All right. Mike, thank you. you can be a little oh, you're very welcome. I'll minute. probably sign oh, off pretty soon. soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Have a good day. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Good night. Good night. We, uh, well, we share my screen here. Uh, you know, I can't have to be Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There's no uh, way anyone's going anywhere from the day. That's right, especially yeah. in the clear. So you got to watch the, the weather. That's right. Every day for the means and yeah. go up and yeah. bad at me. What's the second bad? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we're going up on Friday. I saw Steve and Charles. I wanted to tell us that there were some miles to drop off for a list, but I didn't want to go a mile to get up here. He's just resting the edge of it. Right. Throw the ring to the back, it would be a ter